Hot. What? Red 7. I don't know what Red 7 means. Hot route. I don't. W what is hot route? Will you just go stand on the other side, please? Down. what we call a sack lunch. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> it's time for the Soonerscoop.com post-game show presented by Eskridge Lexus in Oklahoma City. Eskridge Lexus is the official travel partner of Soonerscoop.com podcasts. Now, here's your road crew, Jerry, Eddie, and Bob, wrapping up all the action and reaction from this week's game. It is the Eskridge Lexus Post Game Podcast, where the Sooners go on the road to Cincinnati, uh, and they win it. I believe it was twenty to six. It seems like a roller coaster of a day, uh, considering all that happened and the way the defense played and the craziness of, of the offensive uh, execution at times. But we go now to Cincinnati, uh, where Eddie Radosovich and George Stoya are in the uh, Nippert Stadium press box. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to the uh, Eskridge Lexus Post Game Show. Welcome, welcome to Four Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, what a day. What a day for the defense. What a day for uh, Brent Venable's program, really. I mean, I, I think as much expectation and kind of focus that we put on this one throughout the week and saying that this was kind of a program game. Uh, I think, George, you said it best after the game in the post-game uh, instant reaction recap that we put up on uh, the Soonerscoop.com YouTube channel. What was it? 657 days ago, Brett Venable stood in front of everybody when he took over as the head coach at Oklahoma. Yeah, correct. Um, you know, it, it when he took over, the quote was, relentless, suffocating, physical, punishing defense is what he wanted to bring to Oklahoma. And I think we've seen that in glimpses, you know, maybe even some a little bit last year at times. And, and definitely this year we've seen it. But Saturday felt like from start to finish, that's exactly what this defense was. I mean, that's, you know, you guys might be able to answer this better than I, but it, I can't remember a better defensive performance against a quality opponent. There, there's certainly been times that they've done that against the Arkansas states of the world, but to do that against, and I'm not saying Cincinnati's a bunch of world beaters, but they, they do have good players. They're a good football team, um, and, and their program has been one of the best in college football in recent years. And I know there's been some turnover there, but for them to do that in a road environment and the way they did it to – you talk about the red zone stops, you know, three consecutive fourth down stops in the second half to close out the game. Um, it was it was as impressive of a defensive performance that I can remember. And how about Danny Stutzman? I mean, yeah, he just he, – he continues, and I think that – Hassan McCullough said it after the game. I mean, he's playing at a legitimate buckus level type, uh, you know, a, a level in which we haven't seen from an Oklahoma linebacker in a long, long time. I, I, that's what I'm trying to say. It's It's been very, very good. He's all over the field. He's the heartbeat of the defense. And I really, think he's the heartbeat of the team. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's wrong. And the way that they were able to kind of feed off the energy of what the defense did, especially early, because that thing could have got sideways in the first quarter. And all of a sudden you look up and they 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 were able to get stops. They were able to keep Cincinnati out of the end zone. First time that Cincinnati's been held uh, under seven points in a game since Alabama did it in the uh, national semifinal in 2020. So it was a very impressive performance. And, you know, I, I know that there's going to be people that bitch and complain about how the offense played. They left a lot out there on the field, but at the same time, uh, it just seemed like that was uh, that's kind of the recipe that Brent Venables, that's the style that they want to be able to play at, especially on the defensive side of the football. Well, and for Dylan Gabriel, uh, let's go over his day. I mean, it, was, it wasn't it was spectacular, although you look at the numbers. Uh, if you hadn't watched the game, you would have thought that he was probably a little surgical, a little methodical. Uh, but it was just, it, and guys, it wasn't terrible. Uh, I it, it's hard running the scoop account because everyone's so emotional. It's a lot like the game thread on the Crimson Corner. Uh, a lot of things get thrown out there that people really don't mean. Uh, for instance, I, you know, told me that they didn't play well defensively today on Twitter. I mean, it's 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 a beautiful collection of people out there, Gary. Well, and it's one of those things. It's like yes, I mean. He's the reason, a big part of why the game was so close, because if he doesn't miss Jalil Farouk wide open, if he doesn't overthrow, uh, you know, I think it was Drake Stoops one time in the end zone. Uh, there was another big overthrow. I, I, it must have been Andrew Anthony. Who was it? 
he missed Jaden Gibson in the end zone uh, on the one position that the kick could field right. goal before half. Yeah, and he, he missed Drake over the middle of the field. Through just it hit Drake's hands, but it was yeah. behind him a little bit. And if you catch him in stride on a third down, you're moving the sticks. And I think that that would have been set up for a rather big play. And the biggest one is the fumble. I mean, you just can't fumble. Well, in it's the, the it's the fumble, and then the panic play that didn't hurt him where he actually threw a lateral and it, it yeah. skipped out of bounds, but that was a crucial moment in the game. That really could – for it, it was just kind of frustrating, I'm sure, as a fan because you built up all of this kind of uh, currency throughout the game and you felt like it was just a matter of time before Oklahoma took it over. And really, you have to say, it was the offense's fault why that never happened. Yeah, and, and – I will say there's a bunch of people who are like, well, Jackson Arnold needs to start now. I just that no, that doesn't need to happen. I, I don't think it, it's any different with Jackson Arnold out there. I, look, he, Spitler, Spencer Rattler rolling. wasn't throwing for 322 yards, and he, he wasn't. Yeah. He, and, he was 68 percent completion percentage today, folks. I mean, I, I know he missed some throws, but don't let that take away from the fact that he he did a good job staying in the pocket. I thought the offensive line for the most part, was really good today against the pass rush. Uh, but there's a lot of good things to take away from Dylan Gabriel's performance. It's just the ones you know, the ones that stu- stood out the most to fans were going to be touchdowns that weren't because he overthrew a receiver. Yeah, and the, the difference is, is he's going to have some missed throws here and there. Jackson Arnold is, is definitely a better passer, is going to be more accurate, all of those things. But there, there's something to be said about running the offense efficiently and, and understanding where he's supposed to go with the ball and all those things. And, and Dylan, I thought, made the right reads today. He just missed on some throws. And, and again, that's that's good. I actually thought he was pretty good in the run game. He made some really good decisions when to keep it, when not to keep it. The fourth and the one. The option play was great, yeah. That, yeah, that was a great read on his part. My bigger concern is they still can't run the damn ball. I mean, they, they, they were able to do it in the in the second half a little bit especially on that 75 yard drive marks major kind of came alive but to not be able to consistently run the ball i think it's going to end up biting them in the ass at some point well let's let's go there real quick because you know i i'm back here in the studio getting our live stream up uh from brent venables then you guys had to rush like three floors down uh to the field to go see uh you know the coaches and the or the coordinators and the and the players what was Jeff Levy's response to the running back rotation? I mean, I've never seen someone rotate a pair of backs from game to game. So I guess Iowa State, it's going to be the, I mean, did somebody ask you, like, Iowa State, is it going to be the the uh, J- Javante Barnes, uh, Gavin Sawchuk game now? Yeah, I actually asked him uh, directly, what, how is the rotation shake out? And I've got the quote here. Yeah, here it is. Um, he said, yeah, we'll see as we move forward as – as we see what we're going to get on tape, understand who we're playing, and then how these guys practice every week will create opportunity. And I asked him before that, you know, why was Marcus the guy that they went with today? Because I was pretty – I thought, I thought honestly, Marcus was like the fourth guy that I would have gone with today to start the game. And uh, he basically just said he was the best, best running back in practice this week. So, so I guess they're going to go off of who's practicing well and, and – you know, Marcus was okay today. I thought he played well down the stretch. He kind of found a rhythm. I think that was largely to the offensive line was playing a lot better. George, but, I thought this was his best game as a as a running back for OU. If you even include, I don't know. I mean, the, I thought that was the first time that an Oklahoma running back this year, especially in the second half, and it, it did. You have to give credit. They ran for thirty yards in the first half. Oh, they could have run the ball. Yeah, I mean, it was bad. But it all it all comes together, right? It's all part of one offensive line and then the running backs playing well off of them that was the first time that we had really seen a running back get into any type of rhythm yeah but that's what i'm saying but and sure marcus was carry marcus probably had one of his best games uh at, at ou but you still can't convince me that sawchuck and, and barnes just aren't better like i don't i don't know why they're i mean sawchuck's not even seeing the field i wonder no. how healthy he really is but they didn't even travel Caleb Vicks or Dylan Smothers, which so that, I guess that would mean that Gavin Sawchuk is healthy. I just I don't know, man. And and I, I think Marcus can do a lot for this team and he has a role on this team. He's really good in pass protection, you know, bring him in on third downs, but I just I, I feel like there's much more there. I just I don't know. I don't I don't understand. Maybe Barnes and Sawchuk just suck in practice. I have no idea. This is by far the most puzzling thing that I've ever gone through because I know we've talked about this before. 
But my biggest gripe in the history of OU basketball personnel decisions was playing Chris Brown too much over DeMarco Murray. And now that DeMarco Murray is the running backs coach and makes the decision, now he is he has surpassed Kale Gundy as the most confounding decision maker when it comes to personnel that I've ever seen in Oklahoma. It baffles me. Did you say OU basketball? Before that, or OU football? I think you said OU basketball. Uh, I, my, I, my, I was an out of body experience. I might have said basketball. But you're right, Kerry. You're right. I mean, it's it's similar to that. Like, I don't think any of these guys are as good as Demarco, though. That might be the difference. Oh but hell no! I also I I thought Tawi Walker when he was in there today was still the best running back at times. Like I was like, why not just give him the football? But I don't know. They need to figure that out because, like I said, I. I everybody's going to point the finger at Dylan Gabriel. And then that's what happens when you're the quarterback. But until they get the run game figured out, that's the bigger issue to me is they need to be able to run the football. And uh, you know, they got it done in the second half today for the most part, but even at the end, I mean, they get a holding call that brings back a big run. I mean uh, it's just small things like, and again, I don't know how much it's the running back versus the offensive line versus the scheme. I, I think it's, it's kind of a combination of all those things. Here's what's interesting. If you watch both of those teams today and you said, who played better defense against the run? You would think it would be Oklahoma, uh, but it wasn't. Uh, Cincinnati averaged more yards per rush than Oklahoma did, 3.8 to 3.0. Almost a full yard more. And major major, major uh, average, 4.2 yards per carry. So he, yeah. had a, he had a good day. I just... I don't, we didn't even see Javante Barnes or Gavin Suchuk even get a snap on yeah. offense. I just... It's mind boggling to me. I mean, I just, I don't know. I don't know what, what's going on there. And, and we probably need to ask Jeff Levy, which we won't get to talk to Jeff God. Levy again for till the next game. Uh, Cause they're not doing coordinator availability anymore. Yeah. They just, but we, they, for people that don't know Monday mornings, we usually talk to Jeff Levy and Ted Roof, the coordinators. Uh, and then we talked to Brent Venables on Tuesday. They decided just to cancel the Monday thing now. Like I, I don't think anybody was getting any tough questions that were going to tear apart the program. I mean, I'm not saying he's well, Lincoln Riley, turning into Lincoln Riley, but what's going on, Brent? What's up? I did him? ask him about Riles a couple weeks ago. So. That was, but that was when it had to be asked. That, yes. This is a story. It, and they brought it on themselves. It's 15 minutes. I don't understand why, you know, I don't know. We were just praising them for the media availability a few days ago, and now it's like, well, <laughs> this sucks, but... So what are we going to get, uh, like, play- six player, four players this week after they gave us 16 last week? Yeah. But that question that needs to be asked to Levy, and I probably should just asked it while I was doing the running back rotation stuff, is who's making that final call? I, I assume it's DeMarco. It's DeMarco. DeMarco. It's one. I, I'm not going to say it's 100%. DeMarco. They didn't put DeMarco on the stand and answer the question. Yeah. I, I, What's I don't, going on? I, I don't get it. I, I really don't get it. I I – I'm really hopeful that this program, we can say it's been turned around at some point. So, you know, Brent realizes maybe he can relax a little bit and his coaches can relax a little bit. Like, I work, we all work a lot. I, I'm just baffled, like, that you can't take 15 minutes out of your day. It doesn't through. make a whole lot of sense. And overall, like, I think that there are a bunch of positives out there. I mean, this is, I told George during the post game uh, reaction show that. I think this is one of the more complete efforts just in terms of every time that the offense needed to answer back, they went and put together a good drive every time. And, you know, they, the score, they left a lot of points out there. I thought you know, these were a little bit of an issue. Gary, I, I, I know that there's a lot of people that are complaining about the officiating in the game, which I think yeah. usually happens quite a bit. I It seemed like there were some egregious yeah, uh, calls that, today. The pass interference, look, I can live with the one on Gentry a little bit because there was some – back and forth there. I thought it was a bad call, but the one that they didn't call on Farouk in the end zone, yeah. the non-call, that was one of the worst non-calls I've ever, I mean, they tackled him in the end zone and I don't think he makes the catch anyways, but it was a catchable ball. He didn't even let him try to catch the ball. So that one was, that well, one and I was don't know agreed. if you guys saw the replays. Uh, I have a hard time buying that, you know, they didn't have enough evidence to overturn the catch that Cincinnati made. It, it, oh, that Harry, was terrible. I, the, the replay that they showed in the stadium, it, it looked like it was clearly out of, was out of bounds. bounds. Yeah. So, but, I mean, you know, I know we joked about it. I mean, I haven't been attacked by a microphone in the studio yet, so I don't know if the Big 12 must not be listening this this day, but 
A little bit, I, little I don't conspiracy. Think, I don't think it's a. I don't think it's a situation. Everybody wants to be like, well, the Big Twelve's out to get them. I don't think that's what's going on. But I do think there's probably some like, hey, they're not going to get every call. Like that's going to happen every once in a while. It'll be interesting to see. I, I, maybe we need to converse with some Texas fans and see if they feel like the same thing's going on with them. I wonder how they're going to officiate the OU Texas game. Just not call anything. Just a full-on <laughs> brawl. What if they just don't show up? They don't, they don't supply referees for the game. Well, you remember the one year they gave everyone a personal foul on the field? Uh, and then yes. if anybody else got one, they were going to get thrown out of the game? That All was, time saw. That was the biggest overreaction ever in the history of, of that game, I think, but from a referee. And there have been some really, really bad ones. I mean, there have been interceptions that were not called. Anyway. That was... That was the uh, that was uh, Big Arms guy, right? That gave everybody the uh, personal foul yes. before the game. No, 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 no. It was it was old guy, old white guy. Oh, oh, old guy with glasses. Yeah, with the well, he has white hair. Yeah. I know who you're talking about. But yeah, I I think this group, um, this is a group. I I walk away from today thinking that this is this is a serious Big Twelve title contender. Like they can, and again, I don't know how good Cincinnati really is, but. Uh, to go on the road today, I thought was super impressive. And I just, you know, they're not going to face many better defensive lines. I know that going forward the rest of the year. Now, Corleone um, was everything he was advertised to be. He's really good. He was so good. Um, and so, you know, I, I just look at their schedule from here on out. Iowa State beats Oklahoma State today. I, I still don't think Iowa State's very good. Then you play Texas, and we all know how big of a game that is. And then you look at the rest of the schedule. I mean, BYU, I don't know how good they are. I mean, they I, they were impressive last week against Arkansas, and then um, you know I think TCU ran it up, ran it up on uh, SMU today. What was the final of that score? Last I saw, it was twenty seven to seventeen. I don't know okay. if that ended up being the final or not. So I mean, that could be an interesting game. I just you know I, I just look at if they, if oh you can play the way that they did defensively today, then you can you can uh, be inconsistent on offense at times and still win football games whereas last year because I, I don't think the offense is that much different than it was a year ago in terms of the inconsistencies the difference this year with this group is the defense is getting stops like they're not letting teams back into the game uh and so if you can continue to play at that level defensively and they got to stay healthy you know you got to get canic back i thought he was playing really well today before he got hurt you know reggie pearson it might have lost his job to key lawrence I, I thought key lawrence was phenomenal today but hey real uh, quick george can, uh Tell yeah. us about Jaron Canick, because I know you wrote the story on him, but his situation, yeah. if people have not heard or, or uh, you know, hearing this for the first time, but uh, he was taken away in an ambulance. Uh, there was talk about blood, uh, you know, spitting up blood, a little scary. It clearly seemed to be some kind of a chest situation. Yeah, he got hit. Uh, I thought it was maybe a concussion or ribs or something to begin with, because the way he got, he was in on that, that tackle and he just got up wobbling, and then he went down and I, you know, the Cincinnati crowd thought he was faking an injury and clearly he wasn't, he was in, he was spitting up blood like almost immediately after getting uh, in on the tackle. And then they took him in the ambulance. I think Eddie saw him go by on the cart and was kind of joking around. Is that what you yeah, said? Eddie? He seemed like he was joking around that like one of the traders was trying to keep him in the cart and he acted like he was going to jump out. So he was in somewhat good spirits. Yeah. And that's when I thought to myself, okay, maybe this isn't, a head injury like he seemed like he was his wherewithal was there right and, and i think they took him i mean he was spitting up blood so i think they took him to the hospital just as a you know precautionary sure thing no and he, he kept bleeding. yeah I, I don't think so i mean it, what i was told that he was released from the hospital according to brent and uh i, I also heard from mike Houck that he was he was expected to travel back with the team which is a good sign because if it was a if it was a pretty serious deal and he was still in 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 tough shape they probably would have kept him overnight for precautionary reasons but for him to go back with the team tonight is is a really good sign so i I mean i don't expect he'll be back this week i I would i would think if lewis is going to start at linebacker this week uh for oklahoma which he's been playing great but uh i don't know really the severity it's it's a rare injury you know it's it was kind of noticeable i thought uh, and, and Kip Lewis came in, played great. Um, but I think they need to rotate a little bit more at linebacker. I mean, even even with Danny, I know this is a big game and it was close, uh, but they didn't mind having you know backup defensive backs on the field and they still were making plays. It just seemed to me, I don't know, we'll have to see the snap counts, um, but you know, I felt like for a little bit there, they got a little tired, the linebackers did. 
I agree. Um, I thought especially Danny towards the end looked like he was getting a little bit tired and, you know, he ends up coming up with some big stops there on the fourth downs, but um, yeah, I was surprised we didn't see maybe Kobe McKenzie for a series or something, but it's also, I'm sure, you know, Brent kind of talked about that after the game about how many guys they played. Cause they played, I think maybe 30 got 30 different guys on defense today. Uh, and, you know, he, he said, it's, it's a tough battle with, you know, the coaches because it's like some guys are in there playing great and you don't want to take them out, but you also want to give them a rest. So, you know, and, and Danny was just playing so well today. So it was Can- I thought Canick maybe had his best game of his career today until he got hurt. And so I'm sure they're sitting there like, man, do we really want to take these guys out? So I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see what they end up doing there. And, um, you know, I think Kip's going to play a lot moving forward. And then uh, you look at, you know, is it Connor Nair going to get to play a little bit more? Kobe McKenzie, who's played really well when he's been out there. So uh, I, I think that, they might, and you're, you know, you're going up against the Iowa State team this week. That I mean, you got to play well against, but they should be Iowa State somewhat handily. So I, I wonder if you can get some of those guys some rest this Saturday. Yeah, and you know, Kip Lewis just continues to every time he's in the game, he's kind of like Jackson Arnold on offense. Like every time he gets in there, uh, just to play the position. I know I'm not talking about the the bell dozer. Uh, you're like, wow, I I want to see more of that kid. Okay, uh, yes. let's, uh, you know, we talked about um, a lot of stuff on the defensive side. I mean, there's, I'll say this, like watching Brent in the post-game press conference and, uh, you know, it was asked about, you know, if this is becoming a dominant defense and it was he was kind of like, oh, oh, hold on. I know what dominant defenses look like. Uh, if, if my definition of dominant is perfect, he's like, we're a long way from that. Uh, so I, I, that's one of the things I love about Brent being the head coach. Uh, is that he is so much more demanding uh, than you know? Everyone looks at that defense today, and, and they're like, "Finally, it looks like Oklahoma has a defense again." Whereas Brent's just like, "Yeah, they're okay." You know, I expect a lot more out of those. But, but I mean, he is the definition. Like Eddie, you think about it, like linebacker and, and the the lineage of that position. I mean, it started with you know Torrance Marshall and Rocky Kalmus and Teddy Lehman. Uh, and you had some guys like Travis Lewis along the way, but there has not been that coach at that position since he left. And there was there was never anyone that made you feel like, okay, this guy's going to produce some badass linebackers. Uh, with Britt, you just, I, I don't know, after hearing him today, I was just like, wow, that's that's such a welcoming thing to see that. He's done it. I mean, I, I don't want to say like they're done or that... Uh, Danny Stutzman's as good as he's ever going to get because I think he would be the first person to get, tell you he's going to get better. Brent would be the first person to tell you he needs to get better. But at the same time, I, I, the the jump that they have made defensively, just as a whole and specifically at the linebacker position, it's, it's literally night and day difference from what it was a year ago. And the growth that you've seen out of Danny Stutzman, not only on the field, but off the field. I know that we say that we kind of joke around at the scoop offices that his his interviews have kind of become dull. They've kind of become boring because I think he has really tried to buy in and being a leader on this team. You called him the heartbeat of the defense, or I mean, the heartbeat of the team. It's uh, it, it's been fun to watch, and we're only four games into this. I think that there's still a lot of room for him to grow as a player moving forward. And uh, you know, just look at what Kip Lewis and Kobe McKenzie. I mean, we're we're talking about trying to get them on the field and take off somebody that could be in this type of contention. Yeah, and it, it just speaks to the, the the mentality has totally changed in the program. I mean, it, this quote from, from Stutzman after the game, I thought kind of encompasses it. He says, defense wins championships. That's been a big emphasis for us with Coach V coming in. We want to be the reason the defense. We want to be the why, not the but. That's going to be the emphasis for us for sure. I mean, that's that's – that's Brent Venables to a T. I mean, that's that's what they want to build this thing on, and you know, they're just so much, they're just so much more sound. They're not missing tackles. Uh, you know, they're making plays on the ball. They have ten turnovers through four games this year. They had five through four games last tell, year. Tell, tell Carrie the stat that you told me from Oven. Oh yeah, so Chris Oven tweeted this out after the game. But Saturday marked thirty six years since OU last began four zero with three or few touchdowns allowed. Last doing it in nineteen eighty seven. Wow. <laughs> Gary, that was the year I was born. That's amazing. I mean, there's been a lot of the, the end zone. It's unbelievable. 
by the way, did you look into what I asked you in the post game? Like how the intercepts? I think they're up to eight now. Or are they nine? I can't remember. Uh, they have ten total turnovers. I think it's gosh. I think it's eight interceptions and two fumbles. Is that right? I thought that they had seven interceptions and then they got two today. Maybe and well, then and then the one fumble would be Kanai Walker when he stripped it against right. Arkansas State. Right. right, you're right. So I mean, but was it was it CJ Colden Eddie that had the first interception against Texas last year? Yeah, it was. That's and amazing. It was late in the game. That's amazing. When, like thirty something to nothing. They went five freaking games without an interception last year, and they have. I mean, nine. think about all the times that. We uh, went into the Eskridge Lexus postgame show with Alex Grinch and how much em- emphasis they put on forcing turnovers, and they just couldn't get it. They didn't have players in the right position. They, and, and when the players were in the right position, they weren't good enough to make those plays. Now it feels like they're starting to turn a quarter. And, you know, I, I think that there's going to be a lot of talk like Oklahoma defense. Are they back? It, to an extent, yeah, they're back. But I think that there's so much more out there right now for this group. Well, and they didn't really get – it wasn't complimentary football today. They didn't get the support from the offense that they needed. Um, and I'll, uh, one thing we haven't we talked about, go. guys, field position in this type of game is something that Cincinnati had in spades. Uh, Josh Plaster had a really rough day. He finally had a 45-yarder as his final punt, but he's got to be better or he's not going to have a job much longer. Yeah, punter's bad. The pun, the punting's bad. I mean, they they had a, he had a good one at the end of the game, but I think uh, through his first five punts, he averaged like thirty. I think it was like thirty five, like thirty seven, forty one, which is just not good. Yeah, it was thirty. Uh, so they need to figure that out. But his um, first was thirty seven today. His first was thirty seven. His second was forty one, and then his third was thirty, and then he had that forty five yarder. Yeah, not good. But the, and the last one was good. If he can just do that every time, it'd be, he'd be fine. Yeah. You have a 45-yard They had uh, Al Zinga come in and punt at the end, I think. Did they? I didn't notice that. Hmm. For the uh, Because they were trying to – it was they punted it from like the 50 or whatever. Oh, yeah. I think I was And he punted around. it real low, and it bounced down to like the 10. Well, it's an issue. Um, you know, Gavin Freeman, I thought he kind of just not struggled, but struggled to get involved today. Um, I, I keep thinking that, you know – He's going to emerge some sometime soon, but he just isn't doing... I mean, he had some plays today where he couldn't get around the edge that they had designed for him. I think, you know, Drake had a tough day, you know, doing that as well. Uh, but overall, he had a, a nice day. Um, I just think you come out of this thing, and I think we've talked a little bit about it, uh, and maybe you guys talked about it in your uh, your wrap-up, but i like to see more Nick Anderson targets. Yes, he did. I don't think he came uh, back into the game after he scored the touchdown, and there were some uh, murmurs. Did he get banged up? No, there. he came back in. Oh, he, he did come back in. Yeah, he came back in. He just didn't – I don't think he caught another, he pass, did. another ball. Yeah, I want to see him get the ball in his hands more. He's a playmaker. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, targets right now. Uh, Andrew Anthony led the team with eight. Uh, he had seven catches, 117 yards. Uh, I saw, I'll give Jesse Crittenden credit. I saw he put out this stat. Uh, he's he surpassed today uh, his totals through four game is is reception receiving uh, totals. He surpassed his Michigan career in the first four games. Yeah, he has twenty one through the first four. He had nineteen in not, Michigan, right? How would they not get him the ball more at Michigan? I mean, he's a he's a dynamic. I mean, he he doesn't drop passes. He's he's you know running by guys. I mean, the the pat the catch he made on the fifty yarder. Was a hell of a play. I mean, that should have been pass interference on that play. I mean, he was uh, that ball was underthrown, and he gets in position and makes a tough grab. I mean, he's he's become kind of. Um, it feels like Dylan's almost a, a safety net at times. Like when they need to get a big play or a first down, it, it's going to Anthony. Yeah, and you, you could tell that they you know they had a couple of rushes for uh, Jalil today, so they're trying to get him more involved. Uh, but of course, you know, he's wide open and he gets missed in the end zone, uh, would have been a touchdown. Uh, but yeah, Nick Anderson, he had four targets today, three catches in the, in the, in the touchdown. So he was, he was the fourth person on the team in targets. Andrew Anthony had eight, Drake Stoops had seven and Farouk had six. So they're trying. I mean, yeah, but if he did get banged up a little or whatever, I could see that. 
Heinen uh, remains a non-factor too. I just God. don't get. I I love Austin Stogner. I think he's a good kid. Whatever. I it just maybe it's just because they don't have enough bodies, Gary. I I don't know what they're doing at that position right now. And I know that Devon Mitchell's coming in next year. It just seems like they're in a they're in a really kind of rocky spot right now. I I don't expect Austin Stogner to be a big part of this offense moving forward. And every time that I look up, it seems like he's getting his ass beat outside and blocking. So I, I really don't know what they're doing. Yeah, I think, you know, I think Blake Smith's probably a better choice. But at the same time, I'm I'm all down for the four wides. And, and, and they ran that a lot today. They did a lot yeah. of four wide stuff today. Yeah. Uh, and also they would put Stogner in the backfield to help with pass pro. And then he would come out and be kind of that last option um you know for a short gain and and maybe that's his role is being that guy that can be just a big body back there to help pick up some an extra blitz or something but i don't know I, i'm at the point where i'm ready to see someone else at tight like give give Llewellyn a shot uh give the you know finale kid or however you say his name the basketball player i mean he looks the part i mean let somebody else go out there and at least try to make a play because it's just it's not working with those guys in the past game or just, you know, play five wide and don't play a tight end. I, I don't know what the answer is. I just, I don't think it's Austin Stogner or really Blake Smith. I mean, Blake Smith's been good in the, in the run game. We've had, he's been a better blocker, but uh, in terms of passing game, it's just not there. What about the guys uh, that, that didn't travel today? Did you get a chance to ask about uh, how quickly guys like Reggie Pearson will be back? Did not. We did not get to ask that question i know brent mentioned each of those guys um you know in his post game but he didn't give any sort of updates so i don't know but i will say i the way key lawrence is playing and eddie kind of eddie's the one that said this to me he's like I, reggie pearson might have lost get, his job he get wally pip today i mean i key lawrence the way that he flies around the football field uh, and, you know, what was the big thing? He actually Within made a tackle year, in space and all today. That kind of stuff. What were you saying, Kerry? He made a tackle in space today, Eddie. Like, he yes. he didn't, he, like, wrapped a guy up and, and dragged him down to the ground. I've never seen him do that before. I know that they're still missing tackles, and I know that, it you know, they're going to be tested a lot more here moving forward. But, again, it's the night and day difference just in terms of the fundamentals of defense. They have guys out there like Macari Vickers coming down on a wide receiver today. How many times would you have seen a freshman a year ago just completely whiff out in, out in space? By the way, you just reminded me, Dylan Gabriel almost had a TCU moment today. That dude. Uh, that, God, that, he it did, was, yeah. It was literally to a T, the exact play. Yeah. And, and then the no, no flag. Taken off. I thought no they were flag. about to pick up that flag too because they I had like do. a meeting, and I was like, yeah, "What are you doing?" Well, oh no, they, he did close. get a flag. It wasn't. If they just would have picked it up. I know OU fans would have been pissed. Yeah, but I would have said, "I kind of get." I, I almost thought it was targeting. I mean, he hit him helmet to helmet. Yeah, yeah, that's on what the they road. on the broadcast. Oh, they yeah. they were expecting a targeting call. And that's what I meant. They did. They did call the. They did throw the flag for you know uh, unnecessary roughness. But it really was targeting. He went right after his head, just like it happened at, at TCU last year. Yeah. Yeah, i got to be careful with that. They ran him a lot more today, too, Dylan. And, I, again, I said it earlier, but I thought he made some good choices. But did you guys know there was 25 different guys that made a tackle for OU today? That's crazy. Also, this will go under the radar, maybe. EJ Adabare, man, he's close. He almost had one today. I thought I thought it was watching it live. I thought it was a strip set. Yeah, he was. He he's coming around that edge, and and he's going to get there eventually. I, he's and I mean, and they're playing without our Mason Thomas. I thought that I thought everybody's been worried about the pass rush. I thought that this was the best pass rush they've had all year. By they the way, after the uh, it doesn't show in the stat line, but I thought that Rondell Bothroyd had an excellent day yes. today. He he had a he sack. Did. And it was the most phantom. Like, they showed it on TV. The announcers are like, what are they calling? They called Kendall Dolby for being offsides when the ball was snapped. He was not offsides. Yeah, I I saw that too, Kerry. And I was like, man, that sucks for Rondell because he kind of finally had that moment where he makes a big play. But he was, I thought he was really good in the run game today too. He set the edge. Also, Ethan Downs, he's playing his best football of his career. He started today, didn't he? Uh, But they're just I, I I thought the pass first was pretty good today. They I mean Emory Jones made some plays with his feet. I mean the third and nineteen scramble. I was like, oh man, Brent's not gonna be happy about that. But uh, you know, I thought that they really got after him and, and did some good things and, and 
force some bad throws from him today. I want to remind everybody, uh, Eskridge Lexus is our title sponsor for the post game show. They just do an exceptional job uh, with everything, their service, uh, and you know the the automobiles that you know Lexus are just. We, you know, people say life changing. It's not life changing, but it does really change your perspective on uh, what a car can be. Uh, Eddie and I, both proud owners of the Lexus, um, you know, use their service, and uh, they also uh, help us travel. Their official travel partner. Whenever we need to drive somewhere, uh, they're willing to give us a, a demo to to take out. And so we've, I've given a lot of advice on Lexuses over the years. Not as much as watches. But uh, you do get a lot of because we get to drive so many of the different cars. But the SUV SUVs are great. Eddie's got a compact SUV. I've got the IS. Um, I don't know. Maybe upgrade to the LS someday when I make enough money. Um, so go check them out. EskridgeLexus.com. They're not uh, raking you over the coals. Uh, they're charging MSRP. Uh, they're not charging any extra fees. Just go. Uh, just give them a call. Uh, EskridgeLexus.com. And uh, go to their website, look at their inventory. If they don't have what you're looking for, give them a call. Ed'll Ed'll take care of you uh, and see what he can do if he can get uh, the version of the car that you want the most. So thanks to them for the sponsorship, and thanks for being our, our official travel partner for uh, many many years now. Okay, um, so moving on, guys. Iowa State uh, handles Oklahoma State pretty well. Uh, by the way, I hope you didn't get that uh, OU game at fourteen and a half today. I don't. It, I think it was only there for like a day, maybe. Eddie? Yeah, we got them at thirteen. <laughs> we know some people that had them at thirteen and a half, and it worked out quite well today. Quite profitable. <laughs> yes, I I had them at thirteen and a half. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, no Iowa State now, guys. I mean, I locked Iowa State this week because I thought that they're a team a historic. I mean, historically, they're a team that lays a dud at the end of the year and tends to get better and better. Uh, and Matt Campbell being under fire, being on the hot seat. Um, I thought that he, that team would be ready to play today, and, and they're going to have some confidence now coming into Norman. I mean, I guess. I don't think they're very good, but I honestly didn't watch almost any of their game today. So I, I, I just I think, think Oklahoma was was terrible. I th- yeah, I, I think Oklahoma State is so dysfunctional offensively. It's, it's They started like Alan Bowman and stuck and, but, with him today. Uh, yeah, I mean Iowa State will come in and Matt Campbell will, will will you know have a good game plan and they'll play physical on defense. But after watching this OU offense or defense today, I just I don't know how Iowa State's going to be able to score a ton of points um, yeah. in that game. And I I think OU fans are going to be pretty fired up. You know, night game, uh, they're four and zero. It seems like things are headed Get in the right direction. Texas. I mean, I expect Norman to be you know uh, a great atmosphere on Saturday. So I, I think it's. It's one of those games you just can't look ahead to Texas, right? You don't want Iowa State to just hang around. But uh, I, I I expect Oklahoma to take care of business on Saturday. 17-point favorite, something like that, somewhere in there. And I, I would think they should win by three or more scores. Yeah. By the way, uh, Arkansas State is ahead of Southern Miss right now. They're looking to win oh, their God. second game. Brett Favre's got to go out and steal a bunch of poor people's money again tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Texas and Baylor's just getting going. Uh, they're up 6 nothing. Uh, I know you're going to be listening to this pod later, so it doesn't matter. I'll tell you the, the score that confuses me the most, guys. Um, who is TCU? Like, they lose to Colorado. They, they seem to handle SMU pretty well today. I think they won, like, 34-17. Like, I don't know. I mean, Kansas beats BYU 38-27. I still think Kansas is trouble in the Big Twelve. TCU is a, a to me is a is a seven eight nine seven, somewhere between seven and nine win football team, and they they're going to win some games that they you know probably shouldn't, and they're probably going to lose a couple games that they shouldn't, and that's just what they are. I mean, I I don't know. I I still don't trust Chandler Morris completely back there. Um, you know, I I thought SMU might win today, and the didn't seem like they were really in the game a whole lot, especially in the second half. No, I, th- th- I didn't think Chandler Moore. I don't think he's – I mean, he's certainly not what they had a year ago in Duggan. Um, and from what I've seen, he's a little shaky at times. But anyway, I, I gear, I'm, I'm just waiting for this beatdown that Lincoln Riley's going to put on Arizona State to try and deflect from his reporter suspension stuff. They might score a thousand points tonight, and they might score two thousand points next week against Colorado. Yeah, Colorado's got it coming. Did you see Dan Lanning's pregame speech? 
No, but it, I'm guessing it was probably pretty electric. Uh, he said, "We play for they play for clicks. We play for wins." <laughs> I love that. I love that. Uh, and he He's said, right. "We're not playing He's this game in Hollywood. It. We're playing this game on grass." I love that. So yeah, he's it got it got a lot of people upset, I think, and so and a lot of people loved it. So it was very uh, it, it blew up Twitter this afternoon for for a while. All right, uh, guys, anything talking to the players afterward that kind of stood out to you? I don't know how many guys you had a chance to speak to, um, but I know I saw a lot of support. You know, people saying that Danny Stutzman, you know, should win the Bud Kiss this year and things like that. It, was it a a group that was? I don't know. Were they kind of? sweeping this under the rug or was it a big deal to these guys somewhere in between would that make sense i i didn't get the feeling that they were just overly excited about how they played i didn't talk to danny i was with dylan during that time um I, just from what i felt like it just talking with some of the offensive guys felt like they knew they left a lot out there on the field today and then with the defense is more of kind of what has been uh, a little bit of the theme throughout uh, the first couple of weeks in terms of they know that they're taking steps in the right direction but there's there seems to be a hunger there seems to be a uh, I don't know like an energy that they know that in the grand scheme of things they really haven't done shit let me ask you does Dylan Gabriel always have lays around his neck after games or was there something yeah. special about this game uh, no, he's he's done that the last. Uh, actually, I think he's done it almost after every game. Every I think game, yeah. I think his mom and his girlfriend's mom bring him. Okay. Because I, you know, he downplayed the whole zero and two thing this week, and uh, he didn't. You know, he had some gas, but he he put up good numbers, like we said. Um, I just I just felt like maybe this was a little bit more personal than he let on, and and maybe some of the Satterfield quotes, uh, you know, had something to do with that. Was he even asked about that after no, the game? No, I don't think so. I didn't. I didn't hear anybody ask him about that. I, maybe he probably I would act like he doesn't even know what he, you were talking about. I don't think it. I mean, and what Satterfield said was they were facts. I mean, I, I don't know. I, you know, and I also took out of this game that Emory Jones just isn't a, a very good quarterback. He's pretty average. Yeah. Yeah. He probably. I, he, I think Cincinnati's pretty average. He, yeah, I mean, Cincinnati's at. I mean, if most you, maybe if six or plays, seven well, they went by four touchdowns. Yeah, but they won by two touchdowns. They left so many points out there. This thing could have been over in the middle of the third quarter. Was the uh, Eddie? You were down on the field. Was the uh, environment pretty special? Yeah, I thought it was pretty good. It was. It was definitely loud. Student section was the good. student section was very good, and I thought it was. You know, again in the first quarter, I thought things could have really gone sideways for Oklahoma. As you're kind of struggling with the field position, you're struggling to get out of that hole, and they were able to kind of navigate that, and they were able to uh, kind of get their head back above water. So, no, I mean, I, I thought the crowd was really good. The student section was extremely good. I I thought that there was a lot of Oklahoma fans here. Here, especially on uh, their side of the field behind their bench, so it was um, it was a lovely time in Cincinnati. Well, very good. Um, I tell you what, uh, you know, we're going to be back again, uh, you know, week after week with our post game podcast. Uh, uh, not always uh, on the road. We'll be back for Iowa State, and then we'll see what happens uh, the Texas weekend, how we navigate that. Uh, but we will be here each and every week. So if uh, what you need to do is go subscribe to just look up Oklahoma Sooners post game. Uh, you will see, uh, you know, the the Sooner Scoop uh, kind of. It'll say SoonerScoop.com, but it, all your podcasting platforms. If you're not subscribed, it's different from the unofficial forty. Uh, so in order to get it and to be notified when these come out, uh, you need to subscribe on your uh, podcast channel or podcast service of of choice. So I uh, just wanted to throw that one out there as well. Uh, also, SoonerScoopStore.com. Um, we're uh, been shipping out merch again this week. Uh, we still got plenty. We'll probably have a little. Uh, uh, I'm going to put together a little pre-Texas sell, and we'll tell you more about that on the Unofficial 40 this week, uh, so you can get some discounts on, on some of our merch. Um, but guys, um, you know it's a quick trip back. You're going to be back early tomorrow. Um, any last thoughts? I mean, no one forced anyone to eat Skyline Chili, did they? No, but there was chicken tenders in the press box for lunch today, um, so they obviously knew I was I was coming to town, which I appreciated. I'm honestly just so hungry that I'm ready to get out of here. <laughs> Me too. I'm I'm starving. Um, are you? Do we need to 
I felt like we needed to cut down. Like I didn't. I I wasn't going to bring up chicken tenders. I just feel like you've taken an, a beating socially. I have with this. I have. I have taken a beating. Are you and he has removed his headphones. I think he is ready to. I think he's ready to go. All right. Well, Sooners win it twenty to six. They're coming back home. Iowa State next week. Uh, Jaron Canick uh, appears to be okay. We'll find out more from him uh, about him on Monday or Tuesday, just depending on how that goes. So, uh, appreciate everybody listening, and uh, we'll be back again next week after the Iowa State game for another edition of the Eskridge Lexus Post Game Podcast. We'll see you then.